science panel, which is focused on incentivizing and sustaining scientific software in academia. Um, and we're joined by um, Dennis Cannon, Kenneth Cahoon, uh, and Nick Weber. Um, and this panel is really about recognizing that it's something you guys all know, which is that the production and maintenance of scientific software is a very resource intensive endeavor. Um, and we're going to explore um, how the quest to secure those resources is embedded within a very complex social cultural system of incentives, roles, norms, practices, and organizational structures. Um, and so I'd like to start off by inviting each of you to introduce yourselves. Um, I guess, why don't we just go down the road here, Dennis, go ahead. Uh, my name is Dennis Gannon. I was a professor of computer science at Indiana University. Uh, for about a million years, and I left that, and I got a, was invited to join Microsoft Research, and so I went there. And that was a different role, but a lot of fun. But my background it really comes from uh, really being a guy who liked to write software, uh, in particular for science applications, because I was my research was around uh, parallel computing. And the people who were doing parallel computing were science people. And so I worked with a lot of science projects. I worked with a cosmology project. It was a big NSF project. In this case, it was not the same as you know, what we'll just talk about. It was what about simulating the early universe and on, on massively parallel supercomputers. And another project was uh, uh, on weather. We did a massive thing on weather, in particular, forecasting tornadoes uh, using, once again, supercomputers. And then we did a, a massive project with a DOE on software environments for composable software called the Common Component Architecture. Uh, and then something we worked on that evolved into something called the Global Grid. It was a massive effort involving hundreds of people internationally that uh, the software component of that was the open grid service architecture, which was a huge effort involving lots of meetings and committee meetings and airplane flights and designing something that never got built because people understood the idea of this grid, which was a large collection that everybody would put their supercomputer in a big giant network, would all work together and share resources. Really an idea, no business model. And IBM withdrew, all the other companies withdrew, and something called the cloud was invented, <laughs> where there was a business model. And so anyway, the uh, open grid service architecture never got built. But anyway, I spent a lot of time on a lot of projects, but I have to confess, I'm, with this audience here, all of you very impressive social scientists, in that regard, as I mentioned there in the emails of the committee, in that regard, I feel more like a specimen than a <laughs> Anyway, that's me. Thank you. My microscope. Uh, hi, I am Hannah Cahoon. These are my slides. I'm a postdoc at the University of Utah in their computer science department. I'm working with Jason Vizi. Um, the lab is not study scientific software. I'm, I'm the odd one out there. But I happened into this, uh, my first job getting, after getting my bachelor's was working at the Center for Open Science. And they build a web platform for researchers to share their work. Um, that got me really interested in how technology can be used to change science practice. And I kind of expanded the types of software that I look at now. But I still think of myself as the, the open science framework, what they build is, in my mind, scientific software. Um, so you can actually go to the next one. So there are three main projects that, are, that I've done that are probably relevant to today. Uh, my dissertation work was studying that the open science framework, they're actually very willing to be talked about publicly, that is not a pseudonym. Um, and so that project was studying the development, use, and non-use of that platform uh, as a quality and study. And then what I'm working on now is studying Cloud Lab, which is also not a pseudonym. <laughs> that is really weird to be able to talk about those actual projects. Um, but Cloud Lab is a test bed for researchers to build their own clouds and use this for their research purposes. I've been doing user research for them for the most part. 
And then uh, another project that I spent most of my graduate school time working on was with my advisor, James Hallison. And we studied a panel of NSF funded projects, um, SIU funded projects. So their goal was to create these sustainable communities. And then if you go to the next slide, across these projects, I think the main takeaways that are maybe at least talked about in the group today, there's a couple of them. One of them is how over time, a software project that is sustained stops looking like itself. In that study of NSF funded projects, we looked a lot at open source communities. And in particular, in those groups where because they want people to consistently come and uh, contribute code to the project, they accept almost anything, even if it doesn't fit their organizational vision. And so the project leaders find themselves looking at this software that is not what they imagined. It doesn't have capabilities that they even necessarily wanted to add. Um, in labs, though, you see the same thing. Someone create software, their student rewrites it in a new language, their student adds some capability. It only matters later that it's a much smaller package and not that whole library. It's one project over 50 years. It isn't the same project. Um, another thing that's been really interesting to me lately, and I'm going to skip to the end too, actually, is how uh, software projects have to deal with really mundane stuff like spam sometimes. Uh, the open science framework for like 50% of the meetings that I observed, they had to talk about how much spam was on the platform and how they had to get rid of it. Recently, they hired someone whose only job is to address that. And it's not just the open science community that's like threatened by this cloud that has similar issues. They deal with people misusing the platform for crypto mining. And so these people, like they're spending lots of time and effort and skills on problems that have very little scholarly value. No one's gonna write about how they got spam off of OSF. And it's not just them, it's the Zenodo or it's everywhere. Uh, yeah, these are the interesting things on my mind lately. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Nick Weber. I'm an assistant professor here in the information school. Um, and uh, picking up on sort of some of Charlotte's uh, description of cyber infrastructure projects, I'm kind of a cyber infrastructure native. So I went back to graduate school to do ontology engineering. And I thought, you know, uh, joining this project, it's called the Data Conservancy, which is organized through UCLA. University of Illinois and Johns Hopkins thought we were going to really solve a lot of these data discovery problems at scale. Um, and we failed, like lots of projects that are cyber infrastructure projects failed. Um, and I started getting really interested in why we were failing, um, wanting to do post hoc analysis of there were some technical discrepancies and like what we could actually do and what we promised to do. Um, but there were also a lot of organizational problems with the way that the funding solicitation went out, with the way that the academic institutions were organized, with the way that the teams within those institutions and across those institutions were organized. So I started reading people like Charlotte and um, switched advisors and then uh, ended up for my dissertation going to the National Center for Atmospheric Research and studying model intercomparison projects which have succeeded for a really long time. They are this phenomenal model of cooperation, but not necessarily very good collaboration. And so started to try to understand about how software was shared there, um, started to understand about how model tuning and parameter tuning uh, actually works in this kind of cooperative environment. Um, yeah, and then doing even more native, I uh, joined a postdoc and then started a, a P or sorry, started an assistant professor position where I actually run a couple of large infrastructure projects. They're both open source. Um, one of them is in the kind of political science domain and the other is more in the kind of civic tech domain, um, but have tried to put a lot of what I have learned studying these groups into practice and yeah, succeeding in feeling somewhat better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, well, welcome. Um, I'll start off, off with a few questions, but then I'd like to open it up. So if you have questions, start thinking about those. Um, 
as we've talked about, actually, this has come up numerous times already, the incentive and reward structures differ for software engineers versus academic researchers. Um, can you discuss how to approach these misalignments um, when software engineering is a significant component of an academic research project? So I can speak to that because during my career as a professor, um, it's a very interesting problem. Suppose you're a PhD, recent PhD in, in biology or chemistry, and you go get a tenure track position at a university, and but what you really like doing is developing this new incredible piece of software that's going to help the entire community, and 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 you start basing all of your work around that, and it's, and people say, wow, that's great. And then your promotion committee to make sure you become a, an associate professor rather than just an assistant professor to get tenure. They're going to look at that and say, no, that's not going to fly. It's not science, it's plumbing, and we'll never convince anywhere else to get this done. It's never going to make it out of the out of the college committee or the to the university. You're, you're might as well start looking for another job. And so this is a real challenge. So now we have you know, the notion of this, the professional software uh, research engineer, which is now recognized by this group and others as being something really important. And so it's not very many places in academia where someone can do this. Now I have a counter examples. Um, a good counter example is, is, is Brian Granger. I don't know if you know Brian Granger. Some of you do know Brian Granger. He was, he was uh, he's a physicist, a high energy physics guy. Actually, he did quantum chromodynamics, and he was a, a PhD. Uh, went to uh, assistant professor at, at, at the University of Accounts Poly in San Luis Obispo, and he and another uh, guy uh, also at Berkeley lab, uh, Fernando uh, Perez, developed something called the, the uh, Python. Uh, the uh, uh, I, 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 yeah. <laughs> That's right, Jupyter notebooks. And he created this whole Jupyter infrastructure, which I think is one of the great software achievements in, in the last decade or more. And I use it all the time. And, and he got not only got tenure, but he devoted his career at, at the university just working on around the Python ecosystem or the Jupyter ecosystem, I should say. And that's an encounter example that I see. So it does happen. But it, if you have to do something as monumental as inventing Jupiter, that's really good enough. I uh, did an interview one time where someone was describing their tenure review, where they their core developer for a very successful Python library. They publish on this. They have lots of citations for this publication, and their department chair says, "Yeah, but they only cite you because they use your software." And I, this is, I think about this all the time. It's the, the plumbing. It's like, of course. But something that's really interesting there is that that's part of the that was part of the tenure review process. And is that the right way to have an RSD be reviewed? Is that the same kind? Are those the same kinds of questions that you want? Not necessarily, but I don't have a good answer yet for how to evaluate that career trajectory. I just have another point on that is that in computer science, this wasn't true when I started. I'm very old, so we were just doing you know, punched cards. <laughs> and so computer science was a mathematics discipline. And so uh, you, you didn't have any idea of building systems. Now, building software systems is a, an accepted part of computer science. It's, and, and, and someone can really, and you can write and publish papers about the computer systems that you build. And so in computer science now, it's actually much easier to build a career around experimental software and, and building tools. Yeah, I, I mean, I think this is a really hard question because at the core of it, it's about what do the rewards and incentives trying to achieve, right? And so um, with a career path where you have a assistant associate full professor, like there are certain mechanisms that are in place where you can intervene and say like, you know, we're gonna actually count X, Y, and Z. I think 
problems with institutionalizing research software engineers is our problems of what the career path looks like, mm -hmm. how it gets actualized, um, and what it means to have security within a system that has often treated a kind of role that doesn't have a lot of security. Um, so I think you know, those those issues are are things that administratively are clearly not easy to, to solve, but also I think lots of people that are writing software and that are running grant funded projects aren't always in control of either. Um, so way that those things get fixed, I think within groups is to be clear about what the incentive structure achieves. Um, one of the things that I've been impressed by, I think all of you can, you probably have as well, is like the rapid development of a lot of models in the kind of generative AI space is pushing people towards not really caring about papers that they're publishing on top of these, even a lot of academics. And I've seen people in my department even that put out an application and get 10,000 stars and, you know, three weeks on GitHub. That seems to be a metric that touches on pretty quickly. So I think paradigm shift and think we're probably more in the middle of it than we probably know right now. Well, oh, one more comment. I just want to say, the University of Washington has done a marvelous job of creating a different type of an environment or nurturing software engineering as a discipline here in this facility. This is amazing, very rare. Yeah, I guess one of the things I wanted to bring up is, you know, the, the centers that, you know, that this is trying to build out and are happening on other campuses. I, I guess I don't think of it so much as we're trying to make the same incentives or, or I think we, we do want other types of products to be valued. But there's also that there are going to be research software engineers who are going to be driven maybe by the traditional things that research software engineers are working with academics who are going to maintain those. And how do we have those groups working together in ways that we're 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 recognizing that maybe those are there's some overlapping spaces, but there may be some some places where the incentives are quite different. But making sure that both of those pathways are are getting value from the work that they're doing, right? Um, maybe I'll throw one more question out and then we'll go, I'll, I'll go out to the audience. Um, we're thinking a lot about how these structures exist in the university environment. Um, and so what do you see as the kind of contextual conditions of working within universities and colleges that both pose barriers and really may, maybe provide opportunities for the development and maintenance of scientific software? as I guess, compared to a more industry type atmosphere. Funding, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's one of the biggest challenges is uh, you could get a project, a science project going that will have lines in it to, to hire postdocs and researchers and, and, and software engineers. And how do you hear you know, someone that wants to have a profession, how do you continue that? This is the sustainability of the software you produce. How do you sustain software? Well, that's one point, I think. Um, the lack of continuous funding, and NSF has dealt with this, and uh, um, I think you mentioned this, the, the CI programs that the NSF has tried to do to address this problem, Manish Parashar and, uh, and others have worked hard on this, as well as uh, people within NSF. Another thing is, as you advance in your career, if you're in within academia, if you're starting as an RNC or if you're focusing on software development as you grow your career and maybe become in more of a managerial position, compared to industry, I mean, a product owner probably has a business degree and is focused on managing a team. But if I become the product manager within a product manager, PI, core developer within academia, then I don't necessarily have that same skill set to draw on, but I become responsible for community maintenance, which is unexpected. I mean, I think some of the advantages are also some of the disadvantages, the infrastructure that exists to do a lot of large scale projects to have continuity of, you know, an individual stays for a 
long period of time. I think those are all very big positives. Um, one of the things that I'm really, really bullish on right now is this uh, idea that came out of quantitative economics, where they have launched and over the last decade have been really successful at shaping either what they call postbacs or pre-docs. Um, and these are students that don't have the computational skills to go in and start a quantitatively heavy economics PhD, but do have the domain knowledge, right? And so uh, the amount of, uh, I think, time and money that this community has like developed in order to start these out, to me is really encouraging of some of the disciplinary domain-based knowledge that I think a lot of undergraduates lead programs with and a desire to do things like, oh, I want to work in software engineering. Um, and I took you know, a bunch of bio classes, but bioinformatics is not a field I feel either equipped to or even know exists. And so I think with post back programs or pre-doc programs like that, I think you could make a lot of headway towards institutionalizing roles in research software engineering and also getting students prepared to do really computationally heavy PhDs. Something I'm very excited about right now, trying to figure out how we do this in other disciplines. I, I just thought of another point related to this. I was, it was a lunch, uh, Maddie and I, and uh, we were talking about uh, roles inside the industry uh, that, that is second nature to those of us who have been in the industry that just don't exist comfortably inside academia. One is a role called a PM, a program manager. You know, this is a, a you know, it's a middle level role we manage five or six to a dozen people. And uh, that's an incredibly important part of industrial uh, software development. And it works equally well here. We've got a large number of people doing major projects in software engineering. If there's no way to sort of tell the university, oh, by the way, let's hire someone to be a PM. And they will be a PM and maybe on multiple projects over many years. Uh, you know, that doesn't sort of fit the usual hiring scheme for universities. Maybe UW would be different, but uh, uh, not that I've not seen many places that understand that, that notion. Yeah, we're trying. Not so far, it has not been the thing that we're trying. <laughs> Kareem Lakani's work is at Harvard. He has some work showing project managers making more productive. You know, it's, it's good ammo for I need someone to, <laughs> to take over this work. I wonder, in particular, for open source software development, which I know Hannah and Nick, that's close, very close to both of your hearts. Um, are there structures that universities could put in place to better support um, open source software production and sustainability? I'm besides besides the funding, yeah, yeah. Because, <laughs> but we, we can't have... all rely on Slab Foundation. Open source program offices to me are again like one of these things that I think is uh, extremely exciting as someone who's watched a lot of open source projects look for at the university level some institutional support and said, hey, have you talked to here's Comotion or like the tech transfer office? And that is where a lot of open source projects go to die. Um, so I think <laughs> <laughs> having the ability to um, find institutional support to be able to infrastructure around projects that can get into the kind of community stage is really exciting and I'm, you know, anxiously awaiting those projects getting funded because I think it's a, it's a very innovative infrastructure move. So it's definitely a place where that extra person to help manage the community is really important though. Like the vibe of the websites on a peer production website, you can tell the difference between that and a lab website so easily. Like the number of exclamation points on an open source community's homepage, lots. But if you look at a lab, it's only if they have a new section where they got a, like a new paper published or something like that. But it's, it's, there's a, like a welcoming atmosphere. There's the, I need to bring in that person's pull request because I need them to stay around. There's, we have to have the hackathons. Uh, all of that community management, that's not what I got taught in 
grad school, you know, but you need someone who has that level of expertise to really bring those people and get them to stay. So one of the things that back in the olden days, uh, open source and, and tech transfer offices were a serious problem. I remember going to our tech transfer office with some, I was doing compiler technology for parallel computers then, and we had some stuff that we wanted to make it open source. In fact, we already had some people who wanted to build on it at the national labs. And uh, I was extremely excited about doing that. And they said, oh, you can't just give this stuff away. We're gonna make some money for the tech transfer office. And oh boy, oh boy, that took like seven, eight months to finally convince them that this stuff is worthless. You're not gonna make any money. And uh, uh, they finally, oh, well, okay. And but we took, it was very difficult. But I think it's better now. I asked, I asked Dan Katz, who's at the University of Illinois. He said, I asked him, is it gotten better in this regard? He says, well, no, yes and no. I mean, some universities are very um, open about allowing open source licenses and others still think they're gonna, Make it kill it. So. Yes, let's go out to the audience. For sure. Questions. No other questions. First off, yeah, the technical transfer office is giving you trouble. I'm sorry to hear about the national labs. Just remember, we can always threaten to forcibly nationalize them if they don't let you go. Five percent movement to take it. You know, yeah. that's I joke. I joke. But I do have a question for you. Uh, are we doing enough to learn from failure? And this is a question that I've had about sustainability, right? Is sustainability is a question of health span, of lifespan, right? In this case, of software, of communities, of all of it, right? And there seems to be a really, uh, seems to be a lack of mortality data. Um, well, there's less censoring. You know, I don't really know how many products fail before they can even be seen on the radar. That they just don't make it. It just fizzles out and together. And also, right censoring. When is software even dead, right? When the computer, when the community no longer cares about it, when the funding runs out, right? Uh, you know, on both ends, I feel like, are, are, is there more that we can be doing to learn from what works and what doesn't work? So I think doing that at scale is really hard. There's a bunch of great projects, has, you know, that kind of like lead on one of them uh, to understand that exit to peer production. Uh, I would say that I think in national labs and in universities, one problem that we have that you point out is a denominator problem. We don't know the type of software that gets produced and we don't therefore know its longevity. There's no central place that goes and says like, here's a census every year of the open source projects on our campus. And so Bill Durbin's doing some cool work at Harvard around this, like we've collaborated a little bit trying to figure out like how we might do that more broadly, but that could be a nice first step. We don't have a good accounting yet. You did actually have software census at the National Labs. Um, I think it's died in the last three, four years. Um, but we had to we had to report every piece of software and report how many people downloaded it, how many people used it, every single year as well. So we couldn't, so the problem we had was we couldn't put some of the software up in GitHub and places like that at that point because yes. they didn't allow us to have the statistics when we first started doing it. Yeah, now, now things have changed. Mm -hmm. Good yeah, I, I would say the, uh, you know, in terms of failure, some projects fail, some some succeed and last forever, like uh, Jupiter will last probably forever. And, and then other times things just tend to evolve from one mm -hmm. thing to another. And uh, uh, some, I can tell you, I knew a lot that died. Uh, I was involved in a big project that was good for a long time. Uh, it was a, had maybe 20 universities and lots of good, smart people. Something called High Performance Fortran, HPM. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, so many people might remember that. It totally, totally died. Why? Well, first of all, it was too hard. It, as a compiler, I remember you know, Ken Kennedy standing up in front of an audience and said, this will be the most complicated compiler we ever built. And the other thing is that who really cares? You know, it's, uh, people found other ways to program those computers and no one wants to use Fortran much anymore, but they still around. <laughs> 
Did you want to add something here? I thought I had my train of thought got lost on complicated as a like excited <laughs> action. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Reed, can you can you word it was right yeah. left sensor? Can, can we learn more from failure? So mm -hmm. still oh. think of it as you know, lifespan, health span, but we don't have a lot of data on what they don't succeed. We do have data on when they do succeed, but you know, maybe that you know, there's things we could learn from when they don't. So I guess a question that I've been thinking about is what, what are we sustaining? Are we sustaining the careers of the people creating the software? Are we sustaining the utility of the same user group over time? Are we filling a gap in a field? What if that gap grows and changes? Like the what you are sustaining is I mean, it really affects your question of success and failure there. No, absolutely. That's why I think it's a hard problem <laughs> for that very reason, right? Uh, my take is it's a socio-technical system. So without the people, the software is kind of it, it, it inert, it, it's inert, it hardens, and eventually it becomes useless. Mm -hmm. So it's inextricably tied to the human, the human element of the world, without which it does not exist. Not in any real meaningful sense, even though it looks like it's written down, even though it looks like it's from, but it's not. That's I have money. Yeah. No, I, I, any other day I love talking about failures. I'm constantly <laughs> trying to bring it out. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I think there has been acknowledgement that the current way of building software in academia doesn't work that well. Hence, you know, the future gave us this grant. Thank you, James, to start uh, the SC. So I, I'd like to ask the corollary of that question, which is in the few examples that we hear cited like Jupiter or others where things have succeeded, what are the elements that led to that success? So research tends to be high risk, high reward. Software development and research need not be high risk because there's enough of that. I love the Kleenex code uh, mm -hmm. that you referenced, right? So, Okay, do you have what are your thoughts on what are the elements that help us with successful scientific software? Well, that's a hard question. The elements that, that you could identify that said this will be successful or, or fail boy. Or if you were to deconstruct something like Jupiter, what were the elements that led to that being such a phenomenal success? So something that came up in the in the previous discussion that I wanted to comment on was this notion that. I've seen a lot of people develop, uh, especially young computer scientists will come up with an idea for a great piece of software, perhaps it'll be a workflow system, and they will go to the scientific community X and they will say, oh, you X people, you do the following stuff. I have this hammer and you got to have some great nails there someplace. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a pure formula for failure. Uh, it's that, and I think maybe it was in Will's comments or somebody had a slide that, where it said, you know, understanding what people need and what will make a difference. And in the case of Jupiter, it was this notion that it's a notebook and, and you can try things and, and iterate with things. It was just such a beautiful idea. It was simple and elegant. And um, so finding those things that are that way, that are simple and elegant. Uh, that seems to be the formula for success and useful, simple, elegant, and useful. I use a naive like, take, but I think like all of computing is about abstraction, right? And software that solves problems of abstracting from one level to another is ultimately what gets adopted, what gets cared about, and what gets used. So for me, like looking across all of the projects that I think do things well, it's oftentimes about abstracting away from common problems and then being able to sustain that over time. I think one of the projects I would point to just even on campus is the Rosetta package and the Rosetta Commons. I mean, they have built such a massive community and very productive different labs, pipelines for students. Like to me, that is what we like, what a lot should be aimed at is those kinds of successes. Um, but it started with solving a protein folding problem, right? It's like the abstract. Oh, well, I was just gonna add uh, one thing that I've seen be useful is 
obviously a pipeline for for recruitment. But so in a lab, you have PhD students coming in. But something that I've seen other projects do is set up for a parent organization. I'm seeing this in your in your Venn diagrams. I was thinking about this with the collaborations and then the universities that they have having a parent organization that. Uh, might be the one to hire an RSC and then add them on to your project. Um, that's been a pretty successful way to add new expertise to groups. So. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, just <clears throat> two points. Uh, one is there's a data resource out there that um, might help with some of these questions. Uh, it's called World of Code. Mm -hmm. Colleague Gauders Marcus has put together basically. Every version of every open source project ever in the world, essentially. Um, it's updated about once a month. It's compared against other major collections, and it's pretty complete. Uh, you know, and you do things like uh, see where code gets copied. You know, we, we look, for example, at hackathons, where all the code come from. You, we know exactly where it came from. It could go eventually at some other project. We trace it all the way through. So, yeah, it could help answer questions about success and failure, where code gets used, where does it get used, and what doesn't get used. Uh, so, that's one point I want to make. I'm happy to give anybody pointers to this if you're interested in that. It's not my project, but it's something that's do. Do people have to add to that, or is it somehow like scraped, or like how how do they how do they collect that? Yes, yeah, scraped right. goes out and it you know looks for a new repository. It's got all you know get that mm -hmm. you know source forge all the ones you've heard of plus it's looking everywhere else for anything that's out there that's in here. Okay. Um, so there's that. What was the other thing? Oh yeah, the other thing about success. One of the things that really interests me is whole question of how do open source projects decide what to build, what direction to go, what to do next. Uh, there's a lot of different ways that projects have of uh, sort of getting information from the user community, right? Some do surveys, some just uh, look at code that they write, what they're trying to do. There's a lot of different ways of trying to get that information. Now, what kind of deliberative process do they have in mulling this over, prioritizing, finding the right abstractions, things like that? Uh, so for me, that's one of the next big things I want to look into is what are the different kinds of deliberative processes? How well do they work? Uh, what are the shortcomings and strengths? Those kinds of questions. But I don't think we know too much about that at this point. So one project that I think could be really helpful there is the chaos project. So, um, sure. right. But one of the things that interestingly, I think later releases have done with Augur is that you can go in and uh, trace sort of like the history of an issue discussion. And I've often long thought about like, are there argumentative structures to the way that like certain open source projects evolve? Mm -hmm. um, be interesting. Mm -hmm. right. um, uh, I just wanted to say, I also in terms of like the difficulty of success or failure with sustainability. In, in saying that's difficult, I don't just mean it like conceptually. I mean, even with this resource of all the repos, I don't. The same project might have multiple. The same project might delete one and then create a new one. Mm -hmm. uh, it just like the actual operationalization is very difficult to decide on. It becomes a really like you have to trust me that I'm saying it is or isn't success successfully sustained. Mm -hmm. That's an awesome resource, though. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, it's it is uh, not easy. I agree. But the denominator is really difficult to know because some class of fifty students puts all their course. Projects on GitHub. Do you have now 50 failed open source right. projects? <laughs> most of my staff would say, yes, you do. And so, how do you determine when something becomes an attempt that you should take seriously at an open source project? And at the other end, we try to measure project gap uh, by you know, no, no contributions in the last six months or a year, mm -hmm. right? But there's certain projects out there that are just feature complete. They're still widely used. Everybody uses them, but nobody contributes anymore because they don't need anything else. They're, they're great the way they are. Uh, so that's an ambiguity that we have to figure out how to uh, sort out. So now we use other words, not project depth or project. You know, what we use. 
Saturation or something. <laughs> So a lot of open source projects, really successful ones, I see sort of are guided by an individual or a small group of benevolent dictators mm -hmm. that, that manage to keep it going. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, that seems to be one of the ways it happens. But they're the ones, people that have the insights that make the certain decisions. You know, sometimes they're, they're very dangerous decisions, I remember. You know, transitions to uh, Python 3 from Python 2 was very rough uh, because it broke lots of packages. It reminded me of your example scenario, but they just went ahead and did it anyway. Mm -hmm. And now the packages got updated. Of course. Well, we're coming right up against time. I'll just give each of you a last chance to for any final words you might want to say, and then we can, I think we're, are we moving into the break? Yes. I said enough of this. Thank you all so much. Let's